I want us to start with, uh, this might not apply for everyone who's on Zoom, um, but for those of you who are here, think about for a moment how you got here. You walked into this room. Did any of you have to think about walking into this room? How am I going to take this one step in front of me? We have all kinds of habits that we perform without ever having to think about it. Um, how many of you remember the first day that you walked? You do? You actually do? No? <laughs> I remember the first day my, I remember. Okay. Uh, I remember the first day my nine-year-old walked and she took two steps at the spray park and then went face flat onto the concrete and got a bloody nose. And, but we, we, I want us to think about the fact that this is a learned behavior. Walking is a learned behavior, but we have gotten to the point where it's so cultivated and sedimented into our bodies that we just don't even think about it. And one of the most profound innovations for my research has been to uh, realize that the actions that are most important to us are the ones that we can perform without having to think about it. Typically, we describe these actions as rote or unimportant, but they are actually the most powerful behaviors that we perform because they're as if they're a kind of second nature to us. And these, these actions are producing us a kind of sophisticated know-how in our everyday behaviors. So if, if any of you um, can perform a musical instrument, you, you perform that musical instrument without having to think about where you place your fingers. If any of you type very fast, I can type it like 90 words per minute. And it, literally for me, if I were to try to think about where the letters were, that would make me mess up more. This, that, that ability to type at that speed is, is as if the, the laptop is an extension of my very embodiment in the world. And I, I start all this because we tend to think of religion as mental assent to a list of propositions. We, we tend to reduce faith to, do you believe this about God? Do you believe this about Jesus? Do you believe this about the Bible? And, and your membership in your church is almost always mental assent to a creed or to a, a list of doctrines. And what I want to begin with to invite you into is to imagining faith not as a mental assent to a list of doctrines, but as a habit. Faith is, yes, it in, uh, involves doctrines and creeds, but actually outside of Christianity, most other religions do not prioritize orthodoxy. They prioritize orthopraxy. Um, and so I want you to think about faith more as a habit that is performed and enacted. All the rituals and practices and little things that go into the cultivation of religious life is religious life. I grew up into the church. I was held, loved, and nurtured in the faith. I rubbed the spiritual formation between my fingers as I flipped through the pages of the Bible. I felt the vibrations of faith in my vocal cords as I sang the songs. I smelled faith in the bonfires at church camp. I tasted faith in crackers and grape juice. My entire body was immersed, I grew up Baptist, in, 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 in the waters of baptism. Sitting, legs crossed, and eyes tightly, uh, eyes tightly closed, I raised my hand in Sunday school when the teacher asked if anybody wanted to ask Jesus into their heart. I prayed that prayer many times, not ever sure if it stuck. Still not sure if it stuck. <laughs> I was petrified into the faith. When I was six years old, I gathered up all of my matchbox cars into a duffel bag and said, okay, God, if you're ready for the rapture to happen now, I'm, I'm ready to go. I felt the hands of faith 
When I was seven years old, I went to a church camp, a day camp with a neighbor's church. And the counselor heard, found out that I was deaf in one ear. And so at the chapel one day, all the counselors laid their hands on me and prayed in loud prayers that I would be healed of my deafness. And when they asked, can you hear now? Of course I said yes. What seven-year-old would want to disappoint God? I'm still deaf in one ear. By the time I was in high school, I developed the calloused feet of faith, walking into church three times a week, going to Bible study on Tuesday morning, going to a prayer group on Friday night, going to choir practice once a week. I wore the faith with my Christian t-shirt and with the cross around my neck. I felt the pangers of hunger of faith when I did the 30-hour famine and fasted. Faith was deeply embodied, even though we often live it as if it's a disembodied practice. By the time I graduated from a private Christian college, I was a professional of religiosity. Faith was an embodied skillfulness and intuitive know-how. Without thinking, I understood the meaningfulness of every religious symbol, activity, and affective response around me. From 2004 to 2007, I worked in a mega, mega church of about 3,000 people. There are people still there I deeply love, people that deeply love me. But in those three years, I also saw the dark underbelly of church politics. I discovered the pride, love of power, manipulation, and corruption that can happen behind the scenes. At the same time, I began asking questions about the historicity of the Bible, about evolution. I also grew up in a young earth creationist environment. I was asking questions about gay marriage and whether I really needed to be a Republican in order to be a Christian. It turned out that space that loved me didn't have enough space for my doubts. In the last conversation I had with the founder and senior pastor of that church for whom I was at the time, the personal assistant, he said out of the blue, I think you're going to need a to find a job elsewhere. It seems like you're too liberal for us. 20 minutes later in the staff meeting, he had a grand mal seizure and his, I caught his six foot six inch frame before it came crashing to the floor. A seizure that was brought on by his hidden addiction to opioids. My faith came crashing to the floor. It is a bewildering experience to receive both trauma and grace from the same people. It is disorienting to have both your past and future plans called into question in the same moment. I was undone, yet in being unmade, we are made new. Sometimes we have to lose our faith in order to find it. So how does one pick up the pieces of a fractured faith? Today, I'm gonna to speak about the imagery of deconstruction decolonizing, and I added a third one since alliteration apparently is necessary, my Baptist lean, decomposition. So I got three Ds, I'm so set. Um, we're gonna talk about these three uh, terms, not as just mental ideas, but as metaphors and practices that I want us to live into. So let's begin with a linguistic origin story about deconstruction, and hopefully my uh, computer will work. There we go. Okay, um, Jock Derrida, one of the few philosophers that's actually good looking. Um, <laughs> he is a Algerian. He was an Algerian born atheist and a Jewish French philosopher. He's the guy that coined the term deconstruction. He got this idea by Heidegger's uh, notion of the destruction of the history of philosophy. Heidegger got his notion of destruction from Martin Luther's notion of destructio. You might say then that deconstruction is at the heart of the Protestant Reformation. Now there are huge differences between these three guys, right? Uh, but what I find instructive is how for all of them, deconstruction is both an event and a methodology that was intended to be positive, not negative. 
Luther thought the tradition had become so dependent on its philosophical interpretations of its texts that it had stopped looking at what the Bible actually said. Luther's critique of tradition was initiated by a love for that tradition. And for better or worse, his appreciation for tradition also brought, brought about an innovation. Um, let's just look at two examples of Luther's use of the word destructio. And as you read that, I'm gonna keep going. Um, these are both from his commentary on Romans. For Luther, the task of the destruction of the tradition was both a method of critiquing the tradition, but also a passive event of what God does to us. As a method, Luther's project was one of epistemological humility. Perhaps we have become too in arrogant in our interpretations of the Bible. Perhaps we have become so dependent on accepting arguments from authority that we have lost the possibility of the inbreaking of the new. As a passive event, Luther suggests that destruction is a work of God. Many of us don't set out to deconstruct. It just happens to us. A key point here is that for dis Luther, destructio is ultimately positive. Destruction results in edification. Our own unmaking results in a new creation. Without getting into the details of the phenomenological method, Heidegger extracts destructio from Luther's theological context and applies it to his analysis of Western philosophy. He accuses the tradition of getting so hardened with a well-worn definition of being that it, can see, then it conceals how being is actually revealed in our everyday lives. A destruction was an order, one that should stake out the positive possibilities in that tradition, tradition uh, Heidegger says. So he refreshingly opens up the tradition to innovation and creation, creativity. From this, Heidegger develops deconstruction. He offered numerous definitions, but overarching them all is that he saw as a positive phenomenon that is both something that happens to language itself and as a kind of hermeneutic. As a passive event, Derrida points out that sometimes texts are inherently self-contradictory. Sometimes when we say something, it turns out we say something else, right? That we didn't intend to. When we speak, our words carry a wide semantic range of meaning. And it's precisely from this undecidability that we gain new ideas from our speech. My favorite example for, from uh, Derrida is the notion of the term hospitality. So the word hospitality in our Greek Bibles uh, is literally, is philozenia, which literally means to love the stranger, right? The opposite of xenophobia. Uh, philo, xenia, I would like to say, you could actually translate it as strange love because to, to love a stranger is pretty irrational, right? It's pretty strange. Um, the word hospitality in English comes from the Latin word for, uh, the Latin word uh, hospitus or hospice. It actually has two, two roots that I'll talk about. So it's a combination of two Latin roots. The first one, hospice, is where we get the word hospital. Um, but this word has this strange evolution in its genealogy. At one point, it meant something like hospital. Uh, and it also went on to uh, the word hostess is, is built into this word, at which we get the word host. Um, but this word also originally meant a stranger. And another time it meant enemy, which is where we get the word hostile. Hostile and hospital come from the same root word. And in fact, it went on to mean the word army. And if you grew up reading the KJV, every time the God is called the Lord of hosts, it's the same word. And then it went on to mean guest. The second word that's built into the word hospitality is POTUS. I put POTUS, it's like good dad joke there, right? Um, right, so where we get the word potency, POTUS. So Derrida, uh, so hospitality, the, the word hospital effectively means I have the power to heal you and also to tell you when it's time to leave, right? The word hospitality means when I'm hosting a party, I have the power to invite guests over, but also to tell you, you can't stay here any longer, leave my house, right? Uh, so Derrida locates in this term an, an intrinsic paradox. 
right? Hospitality hinges on the dynamic of having power to let someone into my house, but also of giving up my power so they can enjoy my things. A radical hospitality would be as if I invited you to my house and then I gave you the, the keys of my house. Hospitality hinges on the dynamic risk of inviting the stranger versus inviting the enemy. The risky paradox is most beautifully articulated in the words of rap, reform rabbi Charlie Citron Walker, who after he survived an attempt of, on his life in a hostage situation, he was asked, would you invite someone into your synagogue again? And he said, when someone comes to the door, they are questioning, they're asking, am I going to be accepted? accepted? Am I going to belong? And I want them to know that they are going to belong. We can't forget who we are. Hospitality means the world. So hospitality auto deconstructs. I couldn't establish hospitality as a law, as I couldn't make it a universal mandate that every time somebody knocked on your door, you're required to allow them to come into your house. Hospitality like grace or forgiveness calls into question the law. Derrida suggests that there is something illogical about ethics. Most of the time I think about myself. Most of the time I think about the preservation of my own body. America has its stand your ground laws. We like our stand your ground laws, which is about protecting your property. It's natural and logical that if you punch me, I'm going to punch you back. But hospitality, grace, forgiveness thwart that very logic. Rather than functioning from the logic of a zero sum game or a logic of scarcity, hospitality is a practice born out of the spirit of abundance. Now, Derrida also spoke of deconstruction as a positive method for reading. And Catherine Keller summarizes, to deconstruct is not to destroy but to expose our constructed presumptions. What are all the assumptions that you have about a text? Let's call into question those assumptions. Um, so say you have a favorite book that you've passionately highlighted. This is my, a picture uh, of one page of my Bible from high school. I was a little bit of a Jesus freak. I had a color coding system with over 20 different colors for marking my Bible. I'm not that same person today, but I am that person. And part of the process of deconstruction for me has included learning how to be compassionate with my past self. Now, say over time you've become so accustomed to the portions of the text that you've highlighted that you stop paying attention to the rest of the text. And the parts that you've highlighted kind of become the urtext for you. Deconstruction wonders, what have I missed from the parts of the text that I don't underline? Even more so, Derrida saw deconstruction as an act of justice, consistent with the Jewish tradition of scriptural interpretation, which often seeks to discern meaning by reading between the lines. This is known as midrash. Deconstruction asks, who is missing from this text? What voices have been silenced from this tradition? What are the ways in which our reading of texts have become so calcified that they have been reduced to an algorithm? As John Caputo summarizes, um, to deconstruct is not to destroy, but to apply something loose, to loosen its strings so as to give it a future, to let it reinvent itself, to allow for the incoming of the other. So deconstruction implies that we take texts more seriously breathing new life into them as a result. The spirit of Derrida's deconstruction is out of a deep love for texts and traditions, but one that is willing to run the risk of radical innovation. If time permitted, because uh, I really love this stuff, I could talk about how Augustine actually already prepares the way for this, but I'll spare you that um, since there's only so many people that I can, I can share with. Um, but I want us to think about then habits of deconstruction. So my mentor, uh, George Yancey, defined philosophy as asking of us nothing less than to face both who we are in the world with as much honesty as we can manage. 
to grieve that world and to grieve our own mistakes within that world, and yet to be moved and transformed by the love of wisdom and the wisdom of love. I found deconstruction to be a movement of honesty, a willingness to grieve, and an act of love. So for me, um, in terms of practices of grieving, I've discovered that questioning my faith isn't just a matter of changing my ideas, but of coming to terms with my history and my community and my very sense of identity. Did my parents lie to me when they told me the world was only 6,000 years old? Were my pastors untrustworthy when they told me everything in the Bible is historically accurate? What about my future pl life plans to serve God? How do I deal with the spiritual trauma the church has caused me? For me, deconstruction says you have permission to acknowledge that loss, to process that grief, to reject toxic theology. It's also involved practices of love, in the process of deconstruction, I've discovered that the fundamentalist mindset to think in binary ways continues to haunt me. It's really easy to move from being a fundamentalist conservative to just becoming a fundamentalist liberal. Um, and I have that tendency. Deconstruction has not only served as a space to question my upbringing and wrestle with the Bible, but also to challenge the ways in which I hold too tightly to that need to be right and also to, to grant other people the same amount of patience to grow that I have needed to have myself. It has challenged me to normalize being able to say, I don't know, or to normalize saying, tell me more. To not only feel the, discom the discomfort of being exposed to new ideas, but to cultivate compassion and patience. This is really hard work. Uh, and third, practices of listening. As a philosophy professor, deconstruction has been a pathway to hospitality, as an invitation to listen to the voices that I was not trained to even recognize. Dr. Yancey, who now teaches at University of uh, Emory, Emory University, uh, I, I had him in grad school. He was my first African-American educator in my entire life. These were not voices I was even trained to acknowledge. As I develop my syllabi, deconstruction asks, whose voices have not been heard in a philosophical canon that is basically dead white male Christians from Europe? This has led me to view people of color and people of other faiths, even atheists, as especially in especially historically marginalized communities as important dialogue partners. Now I started out this, this, this lecture with a talk about walking and about how faith is a habit. And white supremacy is also a, a kind of habit. It's a kind of deformation. It is performed, it is enacted. It is the story that we tell. These are habits that are sedimented into our bodies. One of the most uh, profound shifts for me has been to consider how deconstruction requires the further movements of decolonizing my faith. Lisa Sharon Harper writes, if the first 500 years after the Reformation was about the democratization of our faith, then the next 500 years is about the decolonizing of our faith. 500 years, not going to happen overnight. Listening to and learning from marginalized communities who have been othered by the long history of Christian imperialism and white supremacy is a part of the necessary work of faith for formation. And not just decolonizing my ideas, but the practices that undergird and perpetuate those ideas. So I wanna ask us today, what are the rituals, symbols and habits that perpetuate and maintain white supremacy in our religious spaces? What practices, myths, and celebrations contribute to an embodied formation into whiteness? And what might it look like to unlearn these practices and initiate decolonial practices? The deconstruction is also a Jewish hermeneutics, provides an important segue to the project of decolonizing. Jacques Derrida was born in 1930 in Algeria, and as a Jew, 
leading up to World War II, he was forced out of his public school. That was then a colony of France. He was kicked out of school for being a Jew, rendered other by the Eurocentric colonialist gaze. Surely Derrida parted ways with Luther's blatant anti-Judaism and Heidegger's joining of the Nazi party. Listening closely to Jewish scholarship, to bearing witness to their stories and sitting under their wisdom has forced me to confront the anti-Judaism anti and anti-Semitism that is pervasive and normalized in white Christianity. Indeed, in Luther, we discover the shift from anti-Judaism, which believes that Jews could be fixed if they simply convert to Christianity, to anti-Semitism, a type of biological racism that claims that there's something inherently wrong about Jews. In On the Jews and Their Lies, Luther depicts Jews as inherently stubborn, as thieves and robbers, as liars and great vermin, and as the, de the devil itself. To maintain Christian supremacy, Luther advised the ger German government to burn down all synagogues, to burn down all Jewish homes, to confiscate every Talmud, to make it illegal for rabbis to teach and be punished by death, to confiscate their property and to force them to do manual labor. That was in 1543. Luther provided a blueprint for what the Nazis would enact on Kristallnacht, which occurred in fact on Luther's birthday, November 10th, 1938. Luther's book was written within a cultural milieu in which the modern concept of race was becoming socially constructed. In Luther's day, much of the Christian rhetoric about Jews and Muslims revolved around this concept of purity of blood. So Jews and Muslims could convert to Christianity, but there was always this suspicion that they were second-class Christians or that they were feigning conversion. And uh, so they were always under surveillance during uh, the Inquisition. This proto-racial rhetoric was undergirded by supersessionism, a belief that Christianity is the replacement of Judaism, a belief that Judaism should be obsolete and there should no longer be any Jews. And in fact, oftentimes a belief that Ju Jews committed a deicide and were the murderers of God. Supersessionism is a replacement theory, suggesting that God's covenant has been transferred to the church, a belief that underlies Calvinism. In Eurocentric colonialism and global economic expansionism, supersessionism was interpreted to mean that the center of God's plan for the world was the white European church. The modern concept of race develops in tandem with this Christian theological conviction. Christian theology invented the concept of race. In 1492, the same week Columbus set sail, Ferdinand and Isabella implemented their edict for the expulsion of the Jews which forced all Jews and Muslims to leave the country of Spain or be converted to Christianity. Tens of thousands of Jews died. Columbus viewed his expedition as part of this vision of Christian imperialism that would declare the entire world the property of the church. And this framework of suspicion of purity of blood toward Jews and Muslims was the lens by which he interpreted the Taino people of Hispaniola Whereas Jews and Muslims simply had the wrong religion, scare quotes, Columbus describes the, the Taino people as a people without religion, thereby suggesting that they had no souls and were not human at all. In the ensuing decades, the suspicion of Jews and Muslims, the colonialist endeavors in the Americas and the wealth created through the kidnapping and enslavement of black and brown bodies that was seen as God's blessing were intertwined into our modern concept of race or white supremacy. In light of Columbus's voyage, in re direct response to it, in 1493, Pope Alexander VI issued the papal bull Inter Se Terra, also known as the Doctrine of Discovery, stating that as representative of God on earth, any land discovered by Christian colonizers could be forcibly taken for the sake of the church. Being Christian, it was presumed granted one inalienable right to the land. The language of supersessionism undergirded this pronouncement, convinced America was the promised land gifted to the church by God, colonizers defended their land theft and genocide of the Native Americans based on their interpretation of the Bible. Native Americans were forced to convert to Christianity and pledge allegiance to Spain under threat of death. 
As colonizer Martin Fernandez de Encisco summarized it, the Spanish king might very justly send me to require those idolatrous Indians to hand over their land to him, for it was given to him by the Pope. If the Indians would not do this, he might justly wage war against them, kill and enslave those captured in war, precisely as Joshua treated the inhabitants of the land of Canaan. Supersessionism, this pernicious belief that Christianity is a replacement of Judaism, that Christians are better, special, and chosen, pervasively undergirds the entire American enterprise. From the pilgrim city on a hill, to manifest destiny, to Reagan's we are the last great hope on earth, to Trump's make America great again, to Clinton's response that America has always been great, to Biden's America's back. We continue to feel the ongoing effects of this conviction that whiteness is at the center of God's plan. The doctrine of discovery, in fact, is considered precedent in the U.S. Supreme Court. In 1823, in Johnson versus McIntosh, a ruling uh, written down by Chief Justice John Marshall, who enslaved over 300 people, Marshall concludes that white Christian colonizers, due to the character and religion of the indigenous inhabitants who were inferior to the superior of the genius of the people of Europe, white Christian colonizers had right to the land. They had right to take possession of the land from the natives who are considered heathens. The doctrine of discovery has been cited by the Supreme Court as precedent over half a dozen times as recently as in 2006 in a ruling written by Ruth Bader Ginsburg. To this day, one third of all Americans believe that America is God's chosen Christian nation created to be an example to the rest of the world. White evangelical Protestants are the most likely to believe this. Over 50% of white evangelical Protestants to this day believe this claim rooted in white supremacy, rooted in supersessionism. White supremacy isn't just a mental proposition. It's a mythos that we've imagined. It's a story we find ourselves that shapes our very embodiment. This is a way of living cultivated into the very fabric of America. Within the framework of Christian imperialism, the Bible, baptism, and proselytizing were weapons wielded to assimilate black and brown bodies into white supremacy. I too have been spiritually formed into whiteness. Through art, I'm implicitly told that God is an old white dude, that Adam is a white dude. And in fact, all of the theories of scientific racism of the 1800s were presupposed on the idea that Adam was white, that Adam and Eve were Caucasian. Baby Jesus is white. When I went to Spain a couple years ago and traveled through a bunch of cathedrals, I noticed that the only two characters that black bodies could take up in art were either the heads of people killed by the Inquisition and by um, the Crusades or the Magi, right? And so what is this implicitly being told here? We're not explicitly told, but we are implicitly being told that whiteness has insider status in Christianity and that black and brown bodies have outsider status. That the Magi, that you can be kind of a second class provisionary status in the kingdom of God by bowing before a white savior. Consider also Warner Solomon's 1941 Head of Christ. With a distribution of over 500 million copies, this is the highest selling image in, of art in American history. Solomon claimed the image was a divinely inspired image. And some white Christians even claimed it was a photograph. This picture was suddenly reinforces the idea of Jesus Christ as a white dude. And in fact, some people carried this in their pockets to, uh, to show that they were card-carrying Christian Americans rather than card-carrying communists during the Cold War. 
Whiteness is considered divine, godlike, a better depiction of the Imago Dei. I have been formed into whiteness through the centrality of the pulpit and the privileging of European theology. I have been trained to embody whiteness through the hymns of the church. Isaac Watts, who wrote over 600 hymns, who wrote Joy to the World, the father of English hymnody, he set out to rewrite, rewrite the Jewish Psalms into Christian hymns. His Christian supremacy meant that the center of God's plan for the world was the British crown. So every time he got to a Psalm that mentioned Israel, he would replace it with Britain. Take, for example, Walt's, Watt's rendition of Psalm 47, a song declaring that God is the God of all nation. Watts's, Watts's verse six reads this. The British islands are the Lord's. There Abraham God is known. Abraham's God is known. While powers and princes, shields and swords submit before his throne. Watts's rendition isn't merely an anti-Jewish replacement theory of Israel. Watts suggests Britain is now the center of God's plan. That God's throne is equivocal with the British monarchy to whom all other nations submit. The so-called heathen is contrasted with white people. It is no surprise then that Watts in his book on logic claimed that white Europeans were intellectually superior to Africans. When I was in high school, I went to a school named after our 12th president, William Henry Harrison. I was never taught, despite the fact that I lived half a mile away from the Battle of Tippecanoe, that Harrison owned slaves, that he wanted Indiana to be a slave state and advocated for that, and that Harrison's soldiers scalped the bodies of deceased and buried Native Americans. I walked on that land. The Potawatomi Trail of Death goes right past my parents' house. The mascot for my high school is the Raiders. I've heard so many sermons where the word Pharisee was used as an anti-Semitic slur, where it was normalized to depict Jews as the bad guys and Christians as chosen. I grew up going to missions conferences where there was a gigantic American flag hung at the front of the, the church. As we prayed for black and brown souls to accept Jesus and implicitly be baptized into American democracy. I was trained to witness to people with colored beads where black symbolized sin and white symbolized righteousness. With one breath, the preachers and Sunday school teachers of my youth who fostered my spiritual growth proclaimed all people are made in the image of God. And in the next breath, they wanted to keep Muslims out of our country. This internalized white supremacy was not merely intellectual, but was embodied into my soul, day by day, hour by hour, year by year, into the movements were reflexes. It's bewildering that the same people who taught me how to love taught me indifference. It is at this point one might jettison Christianity altogether. The many atrocities, the millions who have been enslaved and slaughtered in the name of Christianity offers a warranted justification to reject Christianity and its theodicy, that everything happens for the greater good, which really means it blesses white people. As theologian William R. Jones wrote in 1973, if we are honest, if the, the historical evidence from the Christian church suggests that God is a white racist, what does it look like to decolonize our faith? How do I grieve an upbringing that trained me into the habits of whiteness? Part of my process of cultivating decolonial habits has included listening to and learning from other faith traditions and not in a way to appropriate their ideas or to assimilate them 
right? That's been the modus operandi of Christian imperialism for 1700 years, but rather to bear witness to their stories. But I've also become compelled to conclude that jettisoning Christianity altogether due to its history of white supremacy would also be a form of maintaining white supremacy because that would then suggest that the only iterations of Christianity that have ever mattered would be white European Christianity. It would be to forget that there are no white people in the Bible, but Africa in the Middle East squares quite prominently in the Bible. It would be to forget the Ethiopian church and the Coptic church and the Latin American church and the black church. It requires willfully erasing the history of marginalized communities that, who found in Christianity not only a vision that confirmed their humanity, but helped them carve out a space for their existence in the world that was not made for them. That provided the tools for subversive resistance against hegemonic systems of imperialist subjugation. In unlearning white supremacist habits, I've been trying to replace them with decolonial habits. Um, I've been challenged, for example, by images that contest the ways in which whiteness has been normalized. Images that invite us into new metaphors of God and faith, but also subversively critique the patriarchy, whiteness, and homophobia that undergird so much Christian theology. It's very interesting. I have my students, we just got done talking about feminist interpretations of the Bible and of God. And all of us in this room will probably raise to pray, dear heavenly father. And I just invite my students to say, just try it, try it out, dear heavenly mother. And every year I'll have students who are like, that's just wrong. I can feel it in my body that it's wrong, right? Like I pay attention to what happens to your body when you see these images, right? Pay attention to how we've been normalized to think that whiteness is the norm and that these are deviations. These are exceptions to the rule, whereas whiteness is the rule. One womanist theologian, um, Angela Parker, points out that in the framework of imperialism, we've been conditioned to believe the Bible must be accepted with unquestioned subservience. She writes that the notion of biblical inerrancy is a form of white supremacy. The word authority actually comes from the Latin autoritas, which actually implies conversations with rather than unquestioning, unquestioned obedience. In short, a practice of decolonizing our faith is an invitation to wrestle with the Bible, to argue with it, and to disagree with it, to see ourselves as dialogue, dialogue partners with the text. So one, one invitation I invite my students in, uh, uh, to participate in is uh, blackout poetry. A blackout poem is done by taking a Sharpie marker to an existing text and creating a poem out of the words that remain, particularly a text that has been used to justify oppression and marginalization. Um, this is uh, one done by uh, one of my friends and colleagues. It's a subversive and redemptive act of resistance. Finally, as I read the Bible or philosophy text and read the news or listen to a sermon, I've also become habituated to ask decolonizing questions, to notice and pay attention. Key one that I've really started in integrating into my classes, when, especially when we talk about the problem of evil and theodicy. Um, if I, oh, go back, go back. What happened? Here we go. Who benefits from this framework? Who benefits from this theology? Who benefits from this political view, right? When somebody says everything happens for a reason, who benefits from that, that view? Whose ideas are privileged? Who's considered a producer of knowledge? Whose experience is being intentionally excluded? Whose history is being remembered? What systems contribute to and perpetuate that exclusion? How have I benefited from these systems? 79% of all philosophers in America are white dudes. Less than 1% are African-American. What beliefs, practices, or stories do I need to give up because they're harmful to others? Decolonizing is an act of love because white supremacy hurts all of us. Maybe there won't be much of a white church left after this process. I mean, I, 
there's a saying that uh, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism, right? Can we even imagine a church that isn't premised on anti-Judaism? I'm not sure we can. But on making results in a new creation. Our metaphors matter. They shape our mind, body, and imagination. One of the weaknesses of the language of deconstruction is how it calls to mind the enlightenment foundationalism of Descartes, as if knowledge is a building that we build and a house that we live in. On this account, knowledge is a building that humans, mostly white dudes, erect, echoing the mechanistic framework of modern science that likens the world to a clock. Humans are machines and run on systematic worldviews. Knowledge is engineered and manufactured. Through such knowledge, Descartes proclaimed that through science, Europeans would become masters and possessors of nature. This view perpetuates colonialism for in the European account of civilization, the only cultures deemed civilized were those that saw humans as separate from nature. Inspired by indigenous ways of knowing, in addition to deconstruction and decolonialism, I've come to appreciate the language of decomposition. Decomposition brings in, us into connection with the soil beneath my feet. And I did not plan this, but our church, The Open Door, is doing a whole theme right now on com composting and on waste. <laughs> And I did not plan this. Um, decomposition brings in connection with the reality that we humans are humus. We are the soil made from the same material as earth. In fact, we're all just stardust. The language of decomposition resonates with the positive force of deconstruction while situating me with a more organic, chaotic, mutualistic metaphor. While deconstruction connotes the imagery that faith is primarily a matter of indi individual belief that I build systematically, decomposition suggests we are mutually dynamically intertwined with all reality. Faith isn't constructed, it's cultivated. In the spring, I plant flowers in the soil and watch life unfold my, before my eyes. In the fall, I place them in the compost bin. Over time, that compost becomes beautifully black topsoil. Without this process of decomposition, there is no life. And uh, just a couple of weeks ago, Pastor John in our church said that the thing that the farm grows the most is compost. <laughs> The process of decomposition isn't devoid of life any less than deconstruction is devoid of reconstruction. In one handful of soil, there are more living organisms than there are people on earth. A single handful of soil contains over 500 species of fungi and potentially more than 30 miles of fungal mycelium. It may even include between 50 and 100 billion individual specimens of bacteria. Your body is a similar ecosystem, a microbiome. There are more bacteria in your gut than there are cells that make up your body, the number of cells that make up your body. This ecosystem of decomposition is integrated with the entire mutualistic relationship of living things that has aptly been called the wood wide web. Better than Kevin Bacon, the underground fungal network links all the trees in the forest within three degrees of separation or less. Forests aren't collections of individual trees, they are complex networks of knowledge. Saplings learn from the older trees in the forest. Trees of different species will share carbon, phosphorus, waters, and hormones through these fungal networks, sending energy to help ailing trees. They are not only interconnected, but reveal that a symbiotic, mutual, and altruistic relations are central to all life. Indeed, the fungal decomposing networks are not only underground, but live directly on trees in the form of moss and lichen, some of the oldest species of life in the world. These are symbiotic ecosystems. The relationship between trees and fungal mycelium call into question our mechanistic framework that living beings are simply autonomous program machines. In contrast, without any brain, this decentralized rhizomatic ecosystem reveals a way of thinking and being that is more integrated, mutually independent, dynamic, and process-oriented. We are finally beginning to catch up 
with thousands of years of indigenous knowledge. Through the work of Robin Wall Kimmerer, a biologist and member of the Potawatomi Nation, I have come to appreciate trees as my teachers. Trees sense their world, respond to attacks, share nutrients, communicate, learn, remember, develop habits, and demonstrate sophisticated forms of intelligence. If I'm patient enough to listen, I can learn from this living intelligence. The soil as it decomposes is my teacher. The moss and its tardigrades that have survived numerous mass extinctions are my teachers. As I embrace and embody the metaphor of decomposition, I become rooted, not as an isolated building, but interconnected with other life forms and life processes. As I take up practices of decomposition, paying attention to moss as I walk has been one of my practices, just noticing all the cracks in the concrete that moss exists. How I've been trained to read the Bible becomes undone. What if the Bible is also an entryway into an ancient, an ancient indigenous world, not shaped by a modern mechanistic framework, but with a view that the world is alive with rock, with pneuma, spirit? What if passages I've been trained to read as dead metaphors are actually gateways to encountering the living, mysterious, dynamic, and holy world? Genesis says the waters are teeming with life. Jesus says, even the rocks have potential to cry out. Isaiah says the mountains and hills burst into song. The trees, they clap their hands. The psalmist says the earth is glad and all the trees of the forest sing with joy. What if when Paul said God was in the business of reconciling all things to himself, Colossians 1.20, he didn't just mean humans but every tree, every tardigrade, and the billions of other galaxies beyond the Milky Way. What if when Jesus said to preach the good news to all creation, he meant it? Announcing with St. Francis of Assisi, good news to sister moon, brother sun, mother earth, even brother death. That's one of the ones we don't like to mention, brother death. For whom, from whom comes new life? for our own unmaking results in a new creation. Thank you very much. Okay, go yeah. ahead. Yeah. Well, I, so um, I hope you have your Slido up and your questions are being um, formulated. We'll give Brock, um, a, a minute or so to drink some water and catch his breath after that just really stunning presentation. Thank you so much. Um, and I believe you have Slido up so you can see kind of who is at the top. Um, if you want to just go through those questions sure. and I'm sure others will come. Okay. In. And it looks like there might be questions on the chat or, or is that just, okay. Okay, cool. All right. Oh, go all the way back. All the way back to the, yeah. the QR code. Yeah. Sure. This thing? Yeah. Okay. Oops. Okay. Uh, and um, I might do a little reverse Q&A because I'm not the only expert in the room. One of the reference I made in this lecture was this whole idea of like the one expert in the front of the room that's also a product of Eurocentric thinking and other traditions learn through community. And so hopefully you are not afraid to also participate in this. Um, okay, so uh, how do you talk with family who are still practicing colonizing Christian ideas? Oh man, that's the hardest one on the list. <laughs> this is the hardest one. Um, and I'm still trying to figure this out. I don't, I mean, I, mean, I, I, I have relatives who, who have used the N-word and I don't, I mean, so it's right, these habits are deep 
seated. Um, I have a family member where I told them about the history of redlining. People know the history of redlining, right? Like hopefully, right? So the US government intentionally systematically made a system where only people in predominantly white neighborhoods could get a loan, a mortgage. Um, we're still feeling the effects of that. And I have a, a family member where I told them like the whole history of redlining and they finally purchased the book, uh, The Color of Law and they read the first chapter and they said, this just made me so angry. I had to stop reading. I was like, but keep reading. You have to keep, right? So it's, I mean, this, there is no easy answer to this question other than like, keep showing up, keep being an example, um, keep trying to figure it out. I mean, right, we're often told at Thanksgiving, which also is a ceremony invented to perpetuate white supremacy. Um, right. <laughs> it wasn't until I was in my 30s that I learned the reason Squanto helped out the, the uh, colonizers. It was because he, he knew English because he had been in, uh, enslaved and taken back to England on a couple of different occasions, right? Um, right? We're told that at Thanksgiving, we're not supposed to talk about these types of things, right? We're not supposed to talk about religion and politics, but so I, I, it takes a lot of courage. And I think finding ways to uh, ask those questions and maybe that, well, that's been one of the challenges for me because my need to be like, that need to be right like, I really want to be, my first initial response is to be combative and be like, well, let me tell you this, actually, right? And that never works, right? It never works. And I, and so, and also like being patient, right? It's taken me years to get to where I'm at right now. And what does it look like to have patience with people who have not had, they've not had to confront the legacy of the white supremacy. And frankly, they've intentionally had a willful ignorance, right? Because if you, if you have access to the internet, all this information's out there, right? But um, so, I, I mean, I don't, I don't have an, an, an easy answer to this one. Uh, showing up, keep pointing it out. Um, I started a petition, a petition to try to get my high school's name changed. It didn't go over very well. Um, but I mean, I like, so you could call it a failure, but right, there are generations and generations of people of color who never saw civil rights, who never saw the end of slavery. And so like, you have to be willing to fail and just keep showing up is, is at least one of the things I've learned here. Um, and just patiently bringing it up. I don't, anybody else want to try to like, Anybody else want to tackle that one? How do you talk with family who are still practicing colonizing Christian ideas? And, and I think maybe one of the things, I'm still practicing colonizing Christian ideas. That's part of the, the reality. Yeah. I'll say at um, Hot Metal, one, oh yeah. um, at Hot Metal, one of the resources people have found valuable as they are trying, and so it doesn't have all the answers. Um, but we um, have studied the White Ally Toolkit by David Camp um, as kind of uh, a starting place for how to have some of these hard conversations with loved ones. Um, so that is a place to start, at yeah. least for us. You know, one thing I've done, well, I've seen happen. So every once in a while, when I teach about white supremacy in my, my classes, I'll have a student email me and like, say, what do I do at Thanksgiving? Or what do I do over the holidays? Um, and I'm always interested to see like, what they say, you know, when they come back, but one of the, you know, I have a, a whole list on the religious studies website, uh, Pitt's religious studies website, I have, I have a whole list I created of uh, scholarship by African Americans about race and religion, white supremacy, the black church. And maybe just take one text and bring, you know, if you have a good relationship with your relatives, just say, would you be willing to read this with me? Let's just start somewhere, right? Like um, Jamar Tisby's The Color of Compromise is one really great book that just kind of goes a, a whole overview of how American white Christianity 
continually perpetuated segregation and white supremacy and lynchings and all that. And, um, and that, that might be one thing you can do. Bob, go ahead. Okay. 40 years ago, I got married. I got married here. And so I invited my family to see my black pastor mm. and my black co fellow congregants mm. celebrating together. Mm. And they don't, they don't really say, my, my white relatives don't really say that much around me. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I, like I said, there's no, I mean, I, I think <sighs> one of the things that's really challenged me is that most of the time with discussions about white supremacy, the more, majority of the people who are expected to do the work are the people who've been marginalized and oppressed by white supremacy. And then white people are expected to just kind of like trail along and, and just kind of wait and see what happens. And I think making that shift and saying, no, this is my, this is my job. This is my task to deal with this. But also at the same time, what the boundaries look like. Like what, what, what are the limits, right? Like every person that I see on Twitter that says something I disagree with is not my job to try to solve, right? Like, and so learning how to make those boundaries is also like for the protection of your own sanity and personal health is, is really important. I don't, I mean, that's not an easy, there's no like one, one uh, step solution for that. Okay, um, how do we balance singing songs like Joy to the World <laughs> with the reality of the foundation of white supremacy? I mean, this is this, I mean, really it's, it's kind of like the same question of like, what do we do with the fact that right, the Declaration of Independence was written by a guy who enslaved 600 people? What do we do with the fact that Martin Heidegger, the most important philosopher of the 20th century, became a Nazi? We're like these are like questions that are just not going to go away, and we can't we can't just excise that from our history. Like Immanuel Kant, most important philosopher in German history, promoted white supremacy explicitly. Right? Like I can't teach a, a modern philosophy class without. And so, like one of my approaches has been to say, look. Kant said this, but he also said this, and just say, look, we, we, have to, we have to know this history. We can't forget this history. But I also think there's a difference between knowing the history and memorializing the history, right? Like, you know, and this kind of goes into the whole Confederate monuments issue, right? Like, memorialize, we don't have to memorialize that history because when we put something as a monument, we're not just saying something about the past, but we're saying something about who we are and who we want to become. Um, so I, I think there are ways in which maybe, maybe decolonizing the hymnal or decolonizing your bookshelf requires that maybe I don't need Luther anymore. Or like I'm, maybe other people who don't have that history did it better. And I, I, and I, I don't, again, I don't think there's a one size fit all um, solution. I mean, I, I think it's, 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 um, I think, I mean, for me, th knowing what I learned about, I've learned about Isaac Watts, right? Joy to the world, the Lord has come, let earth receive her king. I think in his mindset, the king looks a lot like the British monarchy, right? I, I think music has a way that we can kind of transgress those um, original intentions in a way that I think um, you can work through, but I think at the very least, we just can't, we can't ignore it. We can't just act, say, oh, it's not a big issue. It's not, a, it's not unimportant. Um, I don't, the, this is like a perennial question. So I don't, I don't, I don't have like an, an instant answer on this one. This is really a really important one. I think there are ways in which there are some thinkers that we probably just need to divest ourselves from, you know, um, because other people have already said it better, right? Um, um, and with their history. Um, okay. Uh, oh, John, how are you working this out with your family, your spouse and kids? Um, uh, <laughs> my pastor's asking me this. His, 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 of course, his kids just spent the night at my, my kid's house last night. So um, I, this is ongoing. You know, it's interesting, like, 
we've intentionally put our kids in public Pittsburgh public schools for this reason, uh, so that they can have a an encounter with diversity uh, and a commitment to that um, that school system in, in ways that I never had. Um, you know, so my kids are learning about um, you know all kinds of of amazing African Americans during February, right? And it shouldn't be relegated to just Black History Month, but they. Hey, I last week they you know for Women's History Month uh, on Friday the kids are supposed to dress up as like some famous woman, and my daughter dressed up as Taraji P Henson. Um, that never would have occurred to me right as a, as a child like, and, and so I think part of it you know we've been richly uh, I think blessed by allowing, having our kids in an environment where in some ways they're teaching us and, and being willing to be, to be taught by that, by that environment has been very good for us. Um, we've had moments like, I, I, again, um, maybe how you talk about some of these issues and this history is going to be different to talk about it with a nine-year-old, but you know, like when um, there were Black Lives Matter protests going through East Liberty a few years ago, we actually happened to be driving past some of them. And so we explained to our kids what was happening. And we talked about um, sometimes police make bad decisions and they're not always perfect, right? Like they're, you know, and, and trying to get our students or my kids past this some kind of like black, white binary, right? Of, of good and evil um, has been something we've done. Um, but it's also ongoing. Um, That's a great question. Really great question. I don't know. Anybody else want to? How have you worked this out with your kids or family? How do you talk about race with your family? <laughs> reading anti racist baby. Number one on Amazon. Anti racist. <laughs> reading reading anti racist baby. Yeah. You know, I mean, and that's been like encouraging my, my, one of the things I've done intentionally over the years is to look up books um, that have black protagonists, right? Uh, one, at one point I, I noticed that not, up until very recently, the only three storylines black people were given in children's books, a slave, Harriet Tubman, a uh, civil rights activist, Martin Luther King, or an athlete, Michael Jordan, right? Those are the only kid stories that had black people when I was a kid. And, and I think it's changed a lot, but you still have to be intentional. Like, and so just being intentional and encouraging my kids to read children's books where there are people that don't look like them. And, and, and so they're exposed to that and they, and that they're just people. Like they just, they, they deal with different things that you don't deal with but they also deal with just normal everyday things um, has been a, a huge part of, of trying to train them um, and talk about it. Uh, Mike, more about Augustine, please. Um, <laughs> said, said no one ever. Um, so I have a very love hate relationship with Augustine. Like he's really like kind of the problem for, for a lot of stuff that has happened in, a, in a Christian history. Um, but he was North African, right? We don't, well, this is one of the ways uh, history has been whitewashed. Uh, Christian history has been whitewashed and Augustine was, was mestizo um, and struggling with what it looks like to be uh, North African and part of the Roman empire. Um, and one of the things, two, two things that I think are really profound in terms of deconstruction. And, and in fact, by the way, Derrida, quotes Augustine all the time. And he has a whole book about Augustine uh, called uh, Circumfession, which is a playoff of con confessions. And um, so Augustine, there's two things I really appreciate about Augustine. The first one, if you read on Christian Bachman, he has this whole quote where he talks about when we use the word God, we don't even know what we're talking about. The God is ultimately unknowable. And he says, and yet we have a word for that, unspeakable. So when we use the word unspeakable, do we even know what we're talking about? And he goes around and around in circles. And he's like, 
what a contradiction. Like, what do I do with myself? And he basically says like, thanks be to God that like he condescends to us, that, that God condescends and like, listen, that accommodates us. And so what we see in, in really the whole negative theology tradition, mystical tradition is like, metaphors all 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 religious language about god is metaphor even the bible's metaphor all of it this is what maimonides the great uh, jewish philosopher says uh and so th doing theology is this risky task of trying to talk about something we don't even know what we're talking about i mean that's that's August, augustine says this and and that's pretty inspiring to me um the, the so the task of theology is to innovate new metaphors about god uh the second thing that augustine says um, in Confessions, in Book 12 of Confessions, he's doing a whole com commentary on uh, Genesis 1 and the creation story. And, and, and uh, Augustine says, first of all, he says, we can't take this literally because this is definitely not how it happened. Second, he says, yeah, he, he, second, Augustine says, um, we don't even, we, there's no way we could even know Moses' original intent. Third, he says, even if we knew Moses' in original intent, that would be beside the point because the goal of interpretation is not the truth, but the good, the pursuit of the good. He says, and so he, he concludes, any interpretation of the Bible is valid so long as it's motivated by loving your neighbor. That's what Augustine says. That is a pretty risky hermeneutic. And that's, 1700 years ago, right? So that's, that's what I find really fascinating about Augustine, right? So for him, a good text should have multiple interpretations. It should be polyphonic. And I, I think that's just beautiful, yeah. Uh, but I don't need the original sin part of, of Augustine. Um, no one likes to be wrong. What habits as individuals and as faith communities can we adopt that allows us to hear, allows us to hear disaffirming information with grace? I'm not quite sure what disaffirming information means there. Um, uh, information that tells us we're wrong. Oh, okay, okay. Um, I mean, I mean, one of the things I said earlier. It's so like, what is it? I think part of the practice of deconstruction for me is like learning to hold loosely to my beliefs. And again, this is really, really hard, right? Like, especially for those of us raised fundamentalists, it's like, that's how we're trained and indoctrinated to think. Um, and, and so what does it look like to cultivate practices where you hold loosely? Um, honestly, this is where like the Buddhist tradition has really helped me, like Buddhism. Um, one of the, Thich Nhat Hanh, uh, who's like one of my, I'm a, you know, I'm a fan, uh, man crush on Thich Nhat Hanh. He, um, he talks about how so much of our suffering comes from holding tightly, right? So like when you are trying to get someplace quickly and you get, you hit all the stoplights, right? And you, you feel that tension in your body right? You start gripping your knuckles. You're creating your own suffering by holding tightly to that need to get somewhere. And so for me, like mindfulness meditation has been a practice for me to cultivate this willingness to hold loosely to my beliefs, hold loosely to, to, um, and, and, and be willing, like, what does it look like to be, be told I'm wrong? Like to be, to accept that as a gift. Um, that's been very helpful for me. Um, and I think, you know, one of the, I said this to my students earlier this semester, like we've created a culture where ignorance or like being wrong is, is like considered a bad thing. But the great thing about ignorance is you can fix it. Like you can learn, <laughs> right? Like, like indifference, that's harder to fix if you're a cynic, but ignorance, like just so having that, like cultivating that, that willingness to learn new things, like reading books that might make you feel uncomfortable um, has been part of my practices. Um, Simeon, so much of this is tied to American exceptionalism, absolutely, and calls us to grieve our collective sin, absolutely. Ways we can lead congregations in collective repent. Oh my, 
uh, maybe the pastors can help me out on this one. Um, how have you led your, your churches in uh, collective re repentance? I mean, the first thing I would say, like, I think one of the huge challenges for us is to start thinking more collectively. Um, we are so, part of American exceptionalism is I'm the rugged individualist and I'm only responsible for, for, for my own actions. And uh, the reckon, coming to recognize and deal with uh, institutionalized and systematic racism requires us to think more collectively. But um, you know, I think lament is a huge thing. Um, I don't know, any, any of you pastors wanna take this one? What are the ways in which you've, you've um, led your congregations in collective repentance or collective lament? Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunity for creativity around this in the worship space, um, especially in how we write collective liturgies. Mm. And so one thing that Aaron Angeli did for the Commonwealth community for the Trans Day of Remembrance, this is a few years ago, I think it's like pre-pandemic. Yeah, yeah. Um, she wrote and led us in a reflection on how particularly um, Black trans women are at the intersection of a lot of <clears throat> discrimination and violence um, and led us in a collective reflection and like confession of sin collectively as a group uh, around that, along with like a resolve to do better mm -hmm. um, in the future. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's one space where pastors and other religious leaders can give the rest of us language mm -hmm. for talking dealing with and resolving to do something about um, the consequences of systemic racism. Good, Good job, Aaron. <laughs> I think this, uh, America, American culture doesn't really spend much time doing lament, right, and, and grief. So I, the, even itself is, a, is a, a practice that has to be cultivated. It might. Yeah, the people on Zoom. I was just going to mention about what Aaron had done about the Trans Day of Remembrance. What was really beautiful about it is that we took a moment for each woman's name who mm. was murdered mm. to really honor them. So it was a repentance, but it was also holding space for those people. And I think that it was like inviting them into the space as well. And I thought that was exceptionally beautiful. Mm. Thank you for that. That's good. Oh, okay. Uh, are you able to describe how the doctrine of discovery was related to the Supreme Court decision 20, 2006? Um, the court case's name, I actually do have it written down, um, is uh, Cheryl versus Onida. And um, in two, so in 2006, the Onida, Oneida Nation in New York had. Um, uh, accumulated so basically if you know native americans were progressively pushed further west right the trail of tears and everything um so many different events of that the onida nation in new york had amassed uh basically repurchased a bunch of their former land in up in uh, new york and uh in this town uh, Cheryl, I believe, uh, is what it's called, um, and wanted it to be declared Native American land and uh, a Native American reservation. And so it went all the way up to the Supreme Court. And Ruth Bader Ginsburg, in her footnote, uh, references, uh, bas basically says, um, references to the doctrine of discovery that basically the white people have a right to the land through colonization. Uh, and then uh, the, the, the Supreme Court decision was basically like, it's been too long. You know, it's been 200 years since you, you, you had this land. And so like, it's too, basically it's, justice apparently has like a timestamp on it. And so like, if something happened too long ago, we don't have to meet that demand is, was what the Supreme Court decision was. Um, so yeah, usually, yeah. When the Doctrine and Discoveries mentioned the Supreme Court, it, always has to do with Native American land rights. 
So, yeah. Go ahead. To go to the enlightenment, major person behind that doctrine was, of course, John Locke. Yes. The second treatise on government. Right. Right. He said, he said if you did not cultivate the land, you could not own it. Yeah. Right. So, um, so John Locke comes after uh, the papal doc, oh. inter se terra. That's in 1493. But but John Locke is definitely for the the founding fathers, yeah. the key the key guy. He um, for John Locke, the 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 three values uh, inalienable rights are life, liberty, and property ownership. Uh, and his view of property ownership, uh, right? You have. You own everything from the top of the soil down to, to hell, basically, as there's a, some type of famous frame, phrase it. So, um, so the, this idea, Locke perpetuates this idea of, of land ownership as a kind of extraction of resources, which still shapes us today. We speak of the land as a resource, as something that is for our benefit, right? Uh, and so, and Locke is writing at the same time that the um, subdue the earth verse in Genesis is being interpreted as, oh, Amer uh, humans can do whatever they want to with the land. So absolutely, he's a huge, and, and Locke, um, right, he had stock in the slave trade. Um, uh, okay, um, I think we're good. Yeah, thank you so much. Give it up once more for Dr. Baylor.